This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'll be spending a day with people with PTSD to learn the truth about how traumatic events can have long-lasting, life-altering consequences. By the end of this video, we'll find out how decades of deeply repressed emotions can impact one's mental and physical health, and how the body involuntarily reacts when exposed to things that remind us of the source of trauma. Is PTSD only reserved for those who've experienced very clear, life-threatening events like war combat? Or is there a level of trauma that's resulted in conscious or even subconscious PTSD in all of this? Hello, Shailena. Hi, Anthony. How are you today? Autumn. Hey. Kenny. Hey, how's it going, Anthony? I feel like many people watching have heard of PTSD in relation to huge life-threatening events like war. Can you give us a better understanding of what PTSD is like? Post-traumatic stress disorder is really the way that your body and your mind try to survive and protect yourself after a traumatic experience so that you don't find yourself in the same situation. And there are multiple different types of PTSD? Yes, like me personally, what I have is uh, CPTSD, which is called complex PTSD, repeated occurrences. So it keeps happening over and over and over again. It's a huge amount of trauma happening um, and very impactful that really sort of rewrites the brain. And does this type of thing only form in childhood or do you think it can occur at any time? The amazing thing about our brain is that it's capable of what's known as neuroplasticity. Anytime we think a certain pattern, that'll establish a pathway. And the more often we think in that pattern, the more easy it is to take that path. With trauma, our brain will suddenly build a lot of new pathways in order to, like I said, protect us from not having to go through that trauma again. When you're a child, your brain is more malleable. Those, those grooves are gonna get deeper more quickly, but you are perfectly capable as you grow older, even into your late adult life, to have new neural pathways carved in there. It's like a dirt road versus a highway. And you can decide which paths you want to make it to a highway and which paths you leave as a dirt road. And do you feel comfortable walking us through what happened? Of course. When I was around three to four, I started getting sexually abused by my older brother. He would have been around seven, eight, nine. It stopped when I was around uh, six. When I could fully say, this is gonna stop, or I'm telling mom and dad, like, you're gonna get in trouble. I was able to take back my power, and he knew that he had lost full control at that point, and it stopped. Due to remorse, or, you know, him being mad at me for Taking back the power, he did still abuse me, but not sexually. I was sexually uh, abused by my sister uh, from eight to 10 years old. It's almost like a, a reoccurring basis. Parents leave, pornographic movie is played, sexual assault happens. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 10, it just stopped. And I didn't really know why or what it was or why it was bad and why I couldn't talk about it. But for over 20 years, I didn't talk about it. I was told it didn't happen, so I made believe it didn't happen. Everything big happened right when I was in second grade. My dad broke his back. A few months later, our house burned down. And then a few months after that, in our new house, my mom delivered my youngest brother. He was diagnosed with a lot of really complex health disorders. And so my mom and my brother stayed in the hospital for nearly the first two years of his life. I essentially had to learn how to become my parent. And with that became this enmeshment of parental roles and this lack of security and this feeling like I couldn't depend on any safety and that at the drop of a pin, my entire world would come crashing down again. And lacking a family circle, lacking a social circle, and that's where I started to kind of create my own circle of control that helped me cope. And so I followed my dreams. I got this amazing job doing research in Costa Rica. And in leaving, I kind of carried this fear with me of, of what am I gonna come back to? Am I selfish for leaving, for following my dreams? Like my mom ended up losing her fight with depression and she took her own life. And so I kind of had to 
end my dream, come back and help my family. And so there's kind of a lot of different traumatic events that I think build on each other and coalesce into whatever has turned me into who I am today. What PTSD symptoms do you experience and what brings them on? My big key things are smell. When my daughter and my wife wake up in the morning and they haven't brushed their teeth, it really sets me on edge because my abuser had a real problem with the smell of, of their breath. I get like, I get anxious about it. You get really shaky and stuff when you're talking about it. I definitely suffer from headaches, insomnia, waking up just feeling so exhausted from having nightmares all night. As I started to get older, I really felt uncomfortable with men. I would, you know, get weirder. My dad would hug me or even weird around male teachers. I would just always assume that they were looking at me weird. When I would date, guys in high school, I would get really clingy and I would almost like look for this comfort in them that I was trying to find in my own home. I still do that to this day, you know. I haven't dated anyone in two and a half years and I don't have any interest in dating and I feel like it's because I put up this wall. I do have sexual trauma with sex. I can experience symptoms of becoming sick, so my stomach will turn and I will projectile vomit. I could completely be fully the one to engage in the sex. Like, I want this, I want it right now. But if that PTSD trigger comes up, I'm completely unable to control it. There is nothing in me that could stop it from happening. Do you think that maybe this is your body's way of trying to protect you to make sure that these are consensual acts that the person on the other side is going to treat you well and understand you. It's almost like a warning, like, is this really what we want? I know you said this is what we want, but is this really what we want? It's almost like it forces you to take that pause and really gauge if you really want it or not. As much as I hate it, it's kind of a good thing because it makes me really think, you know, is this truly what I want? You know, was I having a good time? Did you repress any of these memories? Yes and no. Like, I knew that it happened, but then I would say to myself, no, it didn't. It happened, but it's not really that big of a deal. And it happened so long ago, so what's what's the point? But unfortunately, you, you're, you just can't let certain traumas go. Even if you try to, your body and your mind sort of latches on. My brain uh, protected me for a very long time. It wasn't until high school when you start experimenting, everyone's talking about sex, you start learning about yourself, you have sex ed. That's when I really was like, oh, this is weird, like this is, some, we're talking about something that seems so familiar to me. And then the flashbacks started. The smells, the chills, everything. Like you can physically be in that moment. You relive all the same emotions. I almost can like see it from her point of view back into that setting and you can literally feel, smell, hear everything. Like even cars driving by the window, like just anything. You said her as if, you know, you feel like it's almost a different, like it's not you, it's, you feel like it's someone else almost. And I feel like that even when I look at like little pictures of myself, she's so innocent. She doesn't know what's actually going. So I just feel like it's a different person, even mm -hmm. though it is me. Maybe that's uh, my form of like trying to heal with it. Do you think that you developed any coping mechanisms to keep these emotions repressed? My coping me mechanism is uh, perfectionism and workaholism. Very much try to control my situation so I don't feel weak and like something bad could happen. And I just carried that with me into adulthood. The first thing that I started doing was isolating. I said, well, at least I have control over my own loneliness. So it made you feel like your loneliness was a choice? It felt like I'm protecting myself, but I also still was wondering this entire time, like why am I not good enough for my friends why, or to make friends? Why am I not good enough to have the social life that everybody else has? And so one of the other ways that I could control that was by physical appearance. And so that kind of manifested as eventually anorexia. I wanted 
make myself perfect because my entire narrative at that point was that I was wrong because I wasn't perfect and I was the reason that I was destroying my family. Was there a moment when these repressed memories came rushing back to you? Most male survivors, it takes about 20 years for them to disclose their childhood trauma. There's other stressors that are on the front burner. And then once things start to calm down and they start to feel safe, their body feels like they are able and they're allowed to enter that emergency stage and begin that healing process. I graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a master's. Me and my wife, we bought our first house. We had our first child and then boom, everything came crashing down. I just couldn't get out of bed. I found myself crying a lot, trying to be consoled by my wife, like motivate myself to, to get up and get out the door. I just couldn't for about two or three days. Thoughts of suicide started to happen. But rather than do it, I called the uh, the hospital and then from there I started going to therapy. Do you think most of us have or will experience some level of trauma in our lives? whether it be one singular major traumatic event or multiple less noticeable ones that may affect us in ways that we might not even realize. We're all gonna suffer traumatic, some traumatic experience in our life on whether that's we lose our favorite pet or a loved one or a foreclosed house, but it can happen at any point in your life, whether you're a toddler or you're an elderly individual. Hey, if you lived through 2020 and 2021, then you've already experienced <laughs> trauma, right? Hey, look at that. All of us experience it together. Nobody ever talked about how to prepare yourself emotionally for not being able to see your friends for over a year, for not being able to see your family for over a year, for having your entire routine, which is so many people's coping mechanism, right? Stripped away from you. And so we're seeing all of these mental health crises appear as a representation of the fact that we are all as a community living through trauma right now. Everybody's gonna go through trauma because that's life. Do you believe that trauma is transferred from one person to another? I believe it can be. Being a father really helps me understand like what I say and what I do has a drastic impact on the way my daughters interact with the world. If I'm positive and I have a positive outlook, that definitely affects the way that they see and they approach problems. And I don't see why it can't be the opposite because I mean, I'm the living example of, of that. Like being in my household, there were there was lots of screaming. There were some physical altercations. That trauma, that negativity, it can transplant like from generation to generation to generation if you don't if you don't take care of it. Were there any ways that your emotional stress and repressed emotions affected you physically? I had stomach aches my entire childhood. I have still to this day really bad migraines because I store all of my stress right here. And so that means it all turns into headaches right here. Same, yeah. And I clench my jaw and I grab my teeth when I sleep. I feel like it's all linked up the same way. Yeah, oh, it's just this constant. <laughs> Just, that's me, that's me when I'm stressed. Yeah, no, <laughs> I've gone to so many doctors to try to figure out how can I make this shit stop? And a doctor yeah. tried prescribing me some kind of like psychological medication that yeah. like had a, this huge list of possible side effects. Yeah. When the more that I'm learning about it, it's like, oh, get, get a little control of your stress. Find a way to practice mindfulness and you, you know, it can, it can loosen it up a little bit. We are still, I think as Western medicine, so disconnected from this mind-body connection yeah. that's really harmful. We're not just a brain on a stick and we're also not just a mindless body. We're both together. And I think so often, speaking of physical manifestations, our body tries to communicate to us, hey, you're stressed. Hey, you need to take a break. And we're so caught up in all of these things that we're trying to accomplish or, or our own plan for the day that we don't even listen into our body. I am 36 six years old and I have technically had a heart attack. I was in the middle of teaching one day. My heart started going very, just, just crazy. It was, it was racing out of control. And this is after I've already been doing um, about two years of therapy. I'm, I'm going through the healing and I'm doing what I need to do. I'm still running and working out every right, day. Which is what you're told to do to be healthy, to have a yeah. healthy heart. Ambulance came, took me away. They ran the test. And when your heart goes through certain trauma, it releases chemicals into the blood. My blood had traces of those chemicals. The cardiologist said that it, was, it wasn't a heart attack, but it's what's called a viral heart infection. So pericarditis. You have a sac that keeps your heart in place, filled with fluid. The sac got infected. It was extremely 
just sick from all the stress. So when that happens, it puts stress on the heart and it makes it feel like you're having a heart attack. Do you think some undiagnosable conditions may be linked to stress or repressed emotions? Before we continue learning about the world of PTSD. When I told my father that what happened when I was a kid, he told me to just forget about it and move on. I just wanted to mention that we'll be making a donation to NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, who provides advocacy, education, support, and public awareness so that all individuals and families affected by mental illness can build better lives. I think we can all use a little support and NAMI is doing some really great things. If you wanna make a donation as well, I'll drop a link down in the description below. Now back to the world of PTSD. Do you think some undiagnosable conditions may be linked to stress or repressed emotions? Stress can trigger autoimmune diseases, and especially if you've gone through uh, substantial amounts of childhood trauma, they can track those children throughout their life, and they see that not only do they tend to have higher risk of cancers, of different kinds of diseases, but even just a shortened lifespan in general. When I was 15, I developed this disease. It was an autoimmune disease and it, it left me completely incapacitated. It left me needing to be taken care of by my mom. I needed to be pulled out of school. Just a year beforehand, my brother's dad left and basically I felt like the entire weight of the household was on my shoulders. And that was at the same time I felt like I could never burden my mom because she was already going through so many of her own stresses. For some reason, it, it stressed me out so much knowing that I had to always be there for the family. When I had this disease, I felt comforted in a way, like my mom was there for me. I was now the kid. It was okay for me to talk about my ailments, the, the issues I was going through, because they were so physical that it was almost like I had permission because they could be seen. Yes. And I couldn't write off these physical symptoms that I had in the same way that I was and have been writing off my emotions mm -hmm. my whole life. Now I'm starting to wonder, did this autoimmune disease occur because of all of these repressed emotions mm -hmm. that I was feeling, all this stress and anxiety that had been building up for years and years that I had no outlet for? All of that burden and pressure that you had been carrying all that time, suddenly you had an excuse to rest. And even though it was because you were mm. sick, it almost was comforting because at least you had that reason to justify the fact that you needed help. And so I could imagine that like, having that tangible reason almost felt like a lifeline. How much does PTSD affect you to this day? It exists and I accept it as a part of me, but it definitely still comes when I don't have control. When I don't have control over something, it rears up as this just feeling like chicken little, the sky is falling, oh my gosh, how do I regain control over this situation? That's the best thing I learned is I can't have complete control. Once you learn you have no control, you gain control. Do you think being a man or being black has impacted your, your trauma or your ability to cope? Absolutely. My blackness affects my trauma and the way that I react to the world. There's a lot of different nuances and it's it's very complicated when i told my father that what happened when i was a kid he told me to just forget about it and move on and again you can't be that upset at what that means i mean you can but you can't because if you think about like that's the way that black males were taught to survive by forgetting their trauma and then just continuing to move on i have no idea some of the things my father has seen so maybe that's his way of coping and so right. we have to understand our generational trauma as well. You've written multiple books touching on PTSD. How is your approach unique in helping people understand and cope with trauma in their lives? I use DC comic books, superheroes and villains to help uh, survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So understand their trauma through, uh, let's say, Batman's need for hypervigilance and the need to control everything, or Superman's perfectionism. Having them see their trauma through a, a superhero character while also connecting it to um, certain therapies so that they can understand like the healing process and steps in order to get better. I wanted to do this because during my healing, we used a book called The Courage to Heal. This book is amazing. It's a great book, but it's written for female survivors. And so 
being in therapy and having my therapist say like, I'm not the only guy that this has happened to, but using a book for female survivors with the her changing the pronouns from she uh, to him. She's reading the book with me. And then like the pronoun would slip up. It really makes you feel extremely alone. If there's anyone watching who feels like they may have experienced or are still experiencing trauma, but don't think it's worth acknowledging because others may have it so much worse than them. Is there anything that you want to say to them? It doesn't matter how big or how small you think or you believe that it is. If it happened to you and you can't, like, you, you can't cope with that, it's huge. Don't minimize your own personal struggles just because they aren't as big as somebody else's. You're never gonna walk into a counselor's office and have the counselor tell you, oh no, you're not broken enough, I don't need to see you. Like that's never going to happen. I see so many people, especially online, now claiming like, oh, that person's trauma or issue, the thing that they went through, like didn't affect them as bad as the thing that I went through. It's almost like, you know, I've seen the term trauma Olympics. Even in the community post that I posted for this video asking what kind of questions people would want to see me ask people with PTSD, uh, one of the things that came up was someone saying like, do you get frustrated when people say that they have PTSD or flippantly use that term? And then I saw some comments responding, you know, even, even coming from a very supportive place saying, yeah, you know, that does, frustrate me. I really don't like it when people say that they have PTSD when it wasn't uh, on the same level or wasn't like diagnosed in the same way that mine was and it minimizes mine and makes it feel less serious. Your own experience with PTSD doesn't invalidate my experience with PTSD. They're two different experiences. Can I just look at you and say, I'm sorry? And you just look at me and say, I'm sorry. And we identify amongst each other, two individuals that are working on growing and just let it be that. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly into camera, go. How to Slow Your Inner Flash by me, Kenneth Rogers Jr. It'll be out within the next month or so. Find me on Instagram, Autumn Woods. And if you're interested in learning more about about CCHS and research that could potentially change lives and look for cchsnetwork.org. If you want to hear more from me and my journey, then follow me at Shailena Bree on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. Subscribe, do it, do it now. Press that button. What are you doing? Why haven't you pressed it yet? Come on, you're here, aren't you? Just it's right there. Press it, press it. I'm not a mind right. reader, so but I think you're I'm looking at it right now and I think it's tempting you. <laughs> After spending the day with these people with PTSD, I've come to understand how trauma likely affects everyone, regardless of how big or small the events or continuous events were that caused it, and how repressing these emotions can have long-lasting, serious effects, and how they often even manifest themselves physically in ways that we may never even imagine to be connected. It's not about who's experienced more pain. We all deserve to feel valid in addressing and accepting the things in our lives that have affected us. Hello, Kenny. Hey, how's it going, Anthony? <laughs> I'm good, hold on. <laughs> My thing just dropped right as I did that, hold on. <laughs> I just sat there trying to act like everything was fine, but it wasn't fine. All right, we're going one more time here.